Hello, folks. Just a quick favor before we start our episode today. We'd be so grateful if you could take just a few minutes to answer an audience survey. It's at surveynerds.com slash civics101. This would be a huge help to us. Again, it's surveynerds.com slash civics101. Thank you so much, and here's the episode. Civics 101 is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Okay. Your levels sound good, Professor? Are you ready to jump in? Absolutely. Absolutely. So my first question, and maybe it's foolish to start with this one, uh, what is money? <laughs> so, um, do you really want me to try to answer that? Money. You may be willing to trade some of that bubble gum for the glass coffee maker to give your mom for her birthday, but the man in the hardware store just may not be interested in that gum. That's why money was invented. This is Civics 101, the podcast fresh course on the basics of how our democracy works. I'm Nick Capodice. I'm Hannah McCarthy. And yeah, today we're talking about it, talking about money. American money. History bills, coins, the mint, you name it. Did you get an answer from him? I did. That is Stephen Mim, by the way. He's a professor of history at the University of Georgia, and he wrote a book called A Nation of Counterfeiters, Capitalist Con Men and the Making of the United States. And he is the first guest on Civics 101 to deal with natural disaster. I don't mean to be trouble here, but athens Clark County is under a tornado warning. Uh, tornado warning for us means that there is a likelihood that there is a tornado in our area. And Stephen stuck it out through a tornado warning so he could tell me about money. And sometimes in this episode, you're going to hear him talking and you'll hear a little siren in the background. But back to my broad question. So money is this thing we all have or we want to have. It's something we need to carry out our daily life. But have you ever just wondered what it is? So Stephen told me that money in its classic sense consists of three things. Number one, it has to store value. It has to hold its value over time. It can't rot like a banana. Two, unit of account. That means its value is measurable, it's countable, and it's the same everywhere, right? No dollar is worth more than any other dollar. And three, medium of exchange. That means it is something that is generally accepted to be exchanged for goods and services. All right, gotcha. But Stephen also said, that question, what is money, the answer will tell you a great deal about the person answering it and less about what money actually is. Anthropologists might invest money with a cultural significance that money originated not to meet economic needs, but rather originated out of something like either religious ritual or kinship relations or some way of creating reciprocity between social groups. Money, in other words, is 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 what you make of it, and it and what you make of it depends very much. If you're asking an academic on your academic training, and I asked that same question to Ellen Feingold, she is the curator of the National Numismatic Collection at the Smithsonian. And what does numismatic mean? A numismatist is somebody who collects and studies money. I prefer a simpler definition of money, and that is, money is anything that can be used to make a payment. And really, any object can serve that purpose as long as it has an agreed-upon value and is trusted for use in transactions. And in the past, in world history, that's been shells, beads, giant stones with holes in them. And in America today, we're talking about coins, bills, credit cards, cryptocurrency, and any of the myriad ways that banks electronically handle our accounts. How did we start using money in America? Was a dollar always this green thing with George Washington on it? No, not by a long shot. Before the United States was created as an actual bona fide, you know, independent nation, America and the colonies that would become the United States experimented with monetary substitutes in ways that actually marked the United States or what became the United States as very unusual. In other words, one of the first um, and really arguably the first state-issued paper currencies in the Western world, at least, came in Massachusetts. So Massachusetts had no way to pay its soldiers. And ultimately hit upon this very interesting idea of issuing what were effectively IOUs that 
would derive their value, interestingly enough, from the fact that they could be used down the line to pay taxes. But when we just started out as a nation, we used other people's money. A motley assortment of coins made in other countries, uh, either Spain or more likely Spanish colonies like Mexico or Bolivia, what have you. To compound this confusion from our modern day perspective, if you were in Massachusetts, a Massachusetts pound might not be the same as a British pound. This sounds impossible. It does, and it was. And that's why we started to make some changes in 1776. During the American Revolution, though, there was there was a desire to create a new currency. So that's really where it dates to. And, and this was a currency known as the dollar. But again, this dollar was not a truly novel creation. It was a dollar pegged to the Spanish peso. That is one reason why the American dollar is divided in the way that it's divided, say in quarters, and originally also in eighths and in halves, because the Spanish peso was divided into eighths. And this made total sense. I mean, it was basically, we were lazy and we were like, look, there's already a currency out there. Most of us handle these silver coins. Let's just roll with this. The peso. I never knew the peso was to thank for the dollar. Right? But speaking of the dollar, let's get back to the paper currency. It caught on really quickly with merchants because there wasn't a lot of money around. It's hard for us to understand now this problem, which bedeviled the, the colonists. And that problem was that there was literally a shortage of money, not a shortage of wealth, but a shortage of things that could be used as tokens to move between people and economic transactions. So people might have huge amounts of silver in the form of, say, plates and teapots and the like sitting on their mantle, but they had no money. The paper money solved this problem. It was a way of making economic transactions move smoothly and operate, you know, less friction than they would when you have to engage in barter or try to pay for a cow with a teapot, in which case, you know, there's a problem making change and, and so on and so forth. But the biggest problem with all these paper bills at the time was forgery. The colonial notes were, 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 were often targets for counterfeiting. And that could be by American colonists, that could be by, by British troops, um, that could be by anyone who had an interest in taking advantage of those banknotes. Um, many of the notes had a statement on them that stated the legal penalty for counterfeiting. They said, to counterfeit is death. Many states went to, well, early colonies went to great lengths to try to make their notes hard to copy. And one of the most famous examples of this uh, comes from Benjamin Franklin. Ben Franklin, who is the kind of Where's Waldo of colonial America, he's everywhere. He devised these paper notes that used a, a, a very uh, kind of proprietary process to take a leaf and turn it into an engraving. And every leaf's veins are unique. So it was kind of this nature looking, like a nature print on the back of his currency. Were counterfeiters actually killed? No. <laughs> I mean, it was the technical penalty in a lot of states, but Stephen said it very rarely happened. Sometimes colonial authorities later hired counterfeiters to make bills for them. And the Secret Service, which today we think of their primary function as protecting the president, that agency was created specifically to deal with forgeries. It was that massive of a threat to our economy. Do they still do that? They do. If you're making some funny money, the Secret Service just might show up at your door. But it's harder today than it was even in Franklin's time. We've got color-changing ink, watermarks, thread that glows in ultraviolet light. It's very sophisticated. All right, when did we start to print a federal greenback dollar? Civil War. So in 1861, beginning of the Civil War, the federal government decides to get into the business of printing money, mainly to pay for the war. So they produce what are called demand notes, and they have this vibrant greenback. 
Um, and they have an intricate design, though not nearly as intricate as the designs become over time. And that, uh, that quickly evolves into a variety of, of types of notes over the decades that follow. And what really unites the design of these notes is a consistent use of, of green ink. And Ellen told me an interesting story about George Washington's face being printed on these. George Washington is currently on the $1 bill, and the predecessor of that bill is a $1 silver certificate. George Washington, when he first appears on that note, does not appear by himself. He actually appears alongside Martha Washington in 1896. And in fact, 10 years earlier, that same denomination, the 1886 silver certificate, actually featured Martha Washington by herself. It's the only example of a, um, of a historic American woman being featured on a federal banknote in a portrait on her own. That's the last time there was a woman on her paper currency. But in 2016, then Secretary of the Treasury Jack Lew announced that Harriet Tubman was going to replace Andrew Jackson, a slave owner, on the front of the $20 bill. It actually initially was going to replace Hamilton on the $10 bill, but after the musical, his popularity skyrocketed and they put an end to that. Today, Stephen Mnuchin, our current Secretary of the Treasury, has not yet committed to the Harriet Tubman change. Something I collected recently that's now on display in our gallery, The Value of Money, is a 3D stamp produced um, by a man named Dana Wall. And it is a stamp of Harriet Tubman. And individuals can use this stamp to stamp Harriet's portrait on $20 bills, thereby replacing Andrew Jackson with Harriet Tubman. Is that legal? Good question. Did you grow up like hearing it's illegal to deface money? Like you're not allowed to mess with money? Yeah, I always had a sense that you really, you shouldn't rip a dollar bill in half or something like right, that. Right, right. It's not legal to rip a dollar bill in half because that's defacing or destroying currency. It's, it's, it's in the U.S. code that you're not allowed to do that. But to Ellen's knowledge, nobody has been reprimanded for stamping money or writing on money because scholars are currently debating what defacing means. And who is actually making our money today? Starting in 1913, the Congress put the Federal Reserve in charge of money production. And the value of the bills produced was tied to a specific amount of gold. This is called the gold standard. We don't do this anymore. I'll talk more about it in a little bit. The Federal Reserve is in charge of money, but the bills are printed by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, whose website is the delightfully named moneyfactory.gov. Do you have any dollars on you? I can go get one. I don't have any cash on me. We're a cashless society. Oh, thank you. What's this? It's a nice fresh dollar bill. Look at this dollar bill. I've never been to uh, either a place that prints bills or a mint. Have you visited one of these? I think I have. Where? In Massachusetts. So there are 12 federal banks under the Bureau of Engraving and Printing that print our paper currency. And if you were in Boston, uh, that is the A bank. So if you look at this a dollar bill... Uh, on the left side, to the left of George Washington, it has a big A on it. That says which of the 12 banks it was printed at. No way! Yeah, so A is Boston, B is New York, C is Philadelphia. You can look up the whole list online. And when it comes to the Mint, I spoke with Todd Martin. He's the chief of corporate communications at the U.S. Mint. He told me the six things that are on every coin. Which are liberty, in God we trust, United States of America, E pluribus unum, which is Latin for out of many, one, the denomination, and the year that the coin was produced. And there's one more feature to look for. It's the mint mark. This is like that letter on the dollar bill. It's uh, a tiny letter on the head side that tells you where it was made. P for Philadelphia and D for Denver. The Federal Reserve, our national bank, decides how many bills and coins to make every year. That's what puts money into circulation so you can have it in your wallet and your back pocket. But far and away, the most fascinating thing I learned about the Mint from Todd, and this doesn't happen with the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, by the way, is that the Mint makes coins and they ship them to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve buys them from the U.S. Mint at the rate of a penny... For a penny, five cents for a nickel, 25 cents for a quarter. Do you understand what I'm saying? No. <laughs> they make a penny. Yeah. And then they sell it for a penny. Right. They sell the Federal Reserve a copperish piece of metal 
that's a penny, and the Federal Reserve pays them a cent for it. So, And that's how the mint pays for itself. Okay, I, I want to get back to this, yeah. right? This dollar bill in my hand here. Does it represent anything? Is there like a piece of gold in a vault somewhere? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, what does this mean? It means that you trust the federal government. So it's fiduciary or fiat currency, uh, which means that it's money because the law says it is and because you choose to trust the federal government and trust the law that establishes our national currency system. When did that change happen? When did we stop using notes to represent silver or gold and start using fiat currency and just trust that this dollar is what it says it is? Who did that? Uh, FDR did, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Therefore, the United States must take firmly in its own hands the control of the gold value of our dollar. You know, when people think about FDR and the New Deal, they always think about, like, Civilian Conservation Corps, or, you know, public works projects and WPA or what have you. But one of the most momentous revolutionary things he did was to sever and put an end to the gold standard. And he did that quite dramatically. It became illegal to own gold. In order for a currency that is a fiat currency to work, you've got to stamp out other the competition. And in this case, holding gold would have been a very potent way of competing with the nation's currency. So it became illegal. There was an f- executive order. Gold was confiscated. And you got paper money in return at a fixed rate. But we kept using gold to represent the value of the dollar internationally until... I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets. President Richard Nixon, 1971, he announced that the U.S. would no longer convert dollars to gold at a fixed value. And that ended all official ties to the gold standard. Now, we have to be careful with fiat currency because now that our money isn't tied to a gold standard, inflation, which means our money is worth less, can happen if you print too much of it, if you're making too much money. And finally, in 1975, it became legal to own gold again. So this dollar only means a dollar because I believe that it does. You got it right on the money. So the next time you look at the number in your bank account... Remember that it only has value because everyone else agrees that it does. Are the levels okay? They seem fine they seem to me. Fine. They seem fine. They're All right, great. let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Five, six, seven, eight. Put it in the bank. Today's episode was produced by me, Nick Cappadice, with you, Hannah McCarthy. Thank you. You're welcome. Erica Janik is our executive producer and has been waiting to do an episode on The Mint for two years. Maureen McMurray is a hip, 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 hip lady. Music in this episode by South London Hi-Fi, Broke for Free, Blue Dot Sessions, Matt Harris, Sarah the Instrumentalist. Nope. Sarah the Instrumentalist. Yep. Sarah the Instrumentalist, Rachel Collier, RKVC, and that wonderful 1910s band, The Weems. There is just so much good heavens to learn about our bills and our coins, what is on them and why it's addictive. And now I can't stop looking at serial numbers on my dollars. To join my newfound obsession, visit our website, civics101podcast.org, where we put links to our favorite explainers on money. Civics 101 is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and is a production of NHPR, New Hampshire Public Radio. Woo! Woo! Go! Okay!